Hey guys, welcome back. This is a very interesting lesson. If you work with databases, you must likely come across a query with lots of joins that was running very slow and you worked tirelessly to optimize the query. Similar scenario will happen with Hive queries and you should be prepared when it happens. This lesson will teach you different ways to optimize the performance of join queries in Hive. This is a very important lesson. We have seen candidates grilled in interviews in the concepts that we're going to discuss in this lesson. But you don't have to worry. We will go step by step in great detail and help you understand every single concept. This is an important lesson not just for interviews. I guarantee you will use the concepts that you learn from this lesson in your day-to-day -day job in your Hadoop environment. Let's see what we're going to learn today. We'll first see how joins work. And then we'll look at stream table hint. We then see different variations of joins like map join, auto map join, and sort merge bucket join, and the benefits of each. That's a lot of stuff to cover, so let's get started. If you have already gone through pig join optimizations, some of the concepts that we go through in this lesson will sound very familiar to you. Let's say we would like to join stocks and dividends data set on the symbol column. We want to first understand how a join is performed with no optimizations. Take a look at the slide and follow the numbers as I go along. In step one, the stocks and the dividends data set are read by individual mappers. In step two, each mapper emits a key value pair. Key will be your join key. In our case, the key is the symbol column and the entire record will emit as the value. Shuffle face will sort the records by key and each key will be assigned a reducer in case of multiple reducers. And records for each key will send to the appropriate reducer. In step four, records from all tables except for the last table in the join will be loaded in memory on the reducer side. In step five, Records from the last table in the join class will be streamed to the reducer. In step six, reducer will cross the records coming from the stocks and dividends and apply the join condition and will derive the result set. Now look at the illustration. There is a small tweak we can do to the query to optimize this join. Can you guess what it is? From step five, we know records from the last table in the join clause will be streamed to the reducer, and records from the other tables will be loaded in memory on the reducer side. We also know stocks table is the biggest table of the two, so immediately there is a chance for optimization. Let's change the position of both the tables and change the query to look like this. Now the records from the stocks table is streamed to the reducer and records from the dividends table will be loaded in memory on the reducer side. Actually, there is a better and cleaner way to achieve the same without changing the position of the table using the stream table hint. Look at this query. Here the stream table hint specifies the table that should be streamed to the reducer. In this case, even though stocks is not the last table in the list of tables in the query, Stocks data set will be streamed because we have specified the stocks data set in the stream table hint. Let's now go ahead and execute this query in the cluster. I have already logged into my Hive session and I'm using the stocks underscore db database. Let's execute the query. This join query will be translated into a MapReduce job. And the execution flow will take the same steps as we have shown on this slide. Now let's wait for the execution to complete and let's review the output. Now that the execution is complete, let's go ahead and check the application in the UI. Here's our recent execution. So let's click our application here. Let's go to the history. This query of ours using the stream table actually used three mappers and one reducer to compute the output. So this query that we executed is a better query compared to the first query that we had. But the most expensive operation in any join process is the shuffle on the reduce phases. Since we are sorting and merging records during those phases, we can optimize the join even more if we avoid both shuffle and reduce phases and execute the join entirely in the map phase. Let's see how we can do that. To enable map joins, Hive introduced map join hints. 
Map joins allow us to execute the entire join operation in the map phase itself. Let's see how it works. Take a look at this query. Dividends is a small data set and we have specified the data set in the map join hint. During runtime, the following steps takes place. A new MapReduce local task is launched just before the original join MapReduce task. This new task reads and serializes the dividends data set into a hash table. The hash table is then uploaded into the Hadoop's distributed cache. Distributed cache is a facility provided by the MapReduce framework to cache files. It could be text files, archives, jars, and so on, needed by the applications. Once you have the files in distributed cache, Hadoop will copy the necessary files to the local file system to all the nodes executing the actual tasks before any tasks for the job are executed on that node, which means the dividends hash table will be available locally to each mapper. In step three, the map only job which does the actual join receives the hash table on all its mappers from the distributed cache. In step four, all the mappers can load this persisted hash table file back into the memory, read the large data set as before, and do the actual join operation. As you can see in the illustration, each mapper will have the entire dividends data set in memory, and each mapper will read corresponding input splits of the stocks data set and will do the join. I have a question for you here. Take a look at the query and the illustration and tell me what kind of join is not possible with the above approach. If you have already gone through our big join optimization, you must know the answer already. Here's the scenario. Complete dividends data set is made available to all mappers and each mappers read a portion of stocks data set. Inner join is straightforward. As the records from the stocks data set is read, it will be joined with the dividends data set, and if there is a match based on the join condition, the record will be added to the output. Now let's talk about left outer join. Stocks data set is in the left-hand side, and each record from the stocks will be scanned against the entire dividends data set, since the entire dividends data set is available in memory for the mapper. If there is a match, the matching dividend records will be included in the result or nulls will be substituted for dividends columns. Let's now talk about right outer join. In a right outer join, you take a dividends record and you're trying to find whether there is a matching stocks record for the dividends record. If you happen to find a matching stocks record in a mapper, great. But what if you don't find a matching stocks record in a mapper? In that case, you cannot simply substitute nulls for stocks because mapper number one might not have the matching stock record, but mapper number two might have a matching record. Hence, for that reason, right outer join is not possible with map join, and for the same reason, full outer join is also not possible since it is a combination of left and right outer join. Let's go ahead and execute this query. This is how the map join, and it works perfectly as long as the user mentioned the map join hint in his query, and also mentioned the smallest table name in the map join hint. If the user forgets to mention the hint, or supplied a large table in the hint, it will lead to some serious performance impact. To avoid this issue, Hive team decided to automatically do the map join whenever possible. So, so far we have seen how join works. We also saw the stream table hint and the map join hint. And we also know how map join works behind the scenes. Now we are going to look at auto map join. To enable auto map join, all you have to do is set the hive auto convert join parameter to true. And Hive will take care of the rest. You do not have to set the map join hint anymore when the Hive auto convert join is set to true. You know, for you to do a map only join, you need to know the smallest table. 
because the smallest table will be uploaded into distributed cache and it would be made available to the, all the mappers. So implementing an auto convert map join is tricky because at runtime, Hive has to know which table is big and which table is small. Take a look at this query on the slide. Here in this query, we are joining the dividends data set with the results from a subquery. At compile time, Hive cannot determine the size of the result set from the subquery. Without knowing which data set is large or small, Hive cannot decide which data set should be held in memory and sent to distribute cache. Let's see how does Hive solves this problem. In step one, a conditional task creates a set of tasks. At runtime, only one of those tasks will be executed. In step two, if the data set from the subquery is big, then the flow number two is executed, in which the dividends data set is sent to distributed cache and will be loaded into memory on all the mappers. The result set from the subquery will be read by each mapper. The entire join operation will be performed on the map phase itself. In step number three, if the dividends data set is considered big, then flow number three is executed, in which the result set from the subquery is sent to the distributed cache and will be loaded into memory on all the mappers and the dividends data set will be read by each mapper. Again, entire join will be performed on the map phase itself. In step number four, if both data sets are big, then the regular join task will be executed. We have been saying small tables, but what size is considered small? Very simple. It is governed by a property called hive.mapjoin.smalltable.filesize property, which is set in bytes. By default, it is set to 30 MB. So if the data set is less than 30 MB, it is considered small. So let's do this. Let's set the Hive auto convert join property to true, and let's execute this regular query joining stocks in the dividends data set with no hints and see what happens. Let's set the property first to true. There you go, it's now set. Let's copy this query. Again, this is a query doing an inner join between stocks and dividends data set with no hints at all. Let's copy. Let's execute this in our cluster. What we're expecting to see is this MapReduce job should execute with no reducers because we have said auto convert map join equals true. And as you can see here, number of mappers is set to two and the number of reducers is zero, which is exactly what we wanted. And as you can see, this join query with auto convert map join set to true executed in 22 seconds. That's pretty impressive. Let's go to the application URL and make sure that the number of mappers and number of reducers. There you go, the number of mappers is set to two and the number of reducer is zero. So this query executed a map reduce job with no reducers at all. Perfect. So far, we have been seeing join optimization with regular tables. Now let's see what kind of benefits we get when we used bucketed tables. When you have tables which are sorted and bucketed, Hive can perform a faster map site sort merge join. This type of join is called SMB join, short for sort merge bucketed join. However, your join should meet the following criteria. Criteria number one, all join tables must be bucketized. Criteria number two, number of buckets of the big table must be divisible by the number of buckets of each of the small table in your query. Criteria number three, bucket columns from the table and the join columns in your query must be one and the same. Criteria number four, the highlighted properties must be set. Let's follow all the mentioned criteria and let's do an SMB map join. So let's create two tables, stocks underscore SMB and dividends underscore SMB. The stocks underscore SMB table will be created with 10 buckets. We will bucket the table based on the symbol column and also sort the records in this table based on the symbol column. So let's go ahead and create this table. Okay, our table is now created. Now let's go ahead and look at our dividends bucketed table. Dividends underscore SMB is a bucketed table with five buckets. This table is bucketed based on the symbol column and also the records inside this table will be sorted by the symbol column. Let's go ahead and create dividends underscore SMB table. Now before we insert records into the table, let's set the enforce bucketing property to true. There you go. Now let's load both the tables. We're going to select the records from the stocks table and insert into stocks underscore SMB table first. 
the number of reduced tasks determined at compile time is 10, which is equal to the number of buckets in the stocks underscore SMB table. So this MapReduce job will load the stocks underscore SMB table in 10 buckets. The execution is now complete. Now let's check the location of this table in HDFS. Let's do a Hadoop FSLS on the table's location. There you go, we see 10 files, so which means the records for this table is stored in 10 buckets. Perfect, now let's load the dividends underscore SMB table the same way. We're again selecting the records from the dividends table and inserting into dividends underscore SMB table. The number of buckets set on dividends underscore SMB table is five. That is why we are saying the number of reduced tasks determined at compile time equals five. The execution is now complete. Now let's check the location of the table again, just like we did for stocks underscore SMB table. We're expecting to see five files under this location. There you go, five files equals five buckets, perfect. Now that we have created two tables and we have loaded both the tables, let's just make sure that both the tables and our query met the criteria that we specified. Criteria number one, all join tables are bucketized and this is met. Both our stocks underscore SMB table and dividends underscore SMB table are bucketed on the symbol column and also the records are sorted on the symbol column. The number of buckets of the big table must be divisible by the number of buckets of each of the small table. And this is met as well. Our stocks table is created with 10 buckets and our dividends table is divided with five buckets. So the number of buckets from the stocks table is perfectly divisible by the number of buckets from the dividends table. Criteria number three, bucket columns in our table and the join columns in the query must be one and the same. And this is met if you look at this query. Our tables are bucketed and sorted on the symbol column. Our query is also joining both the stocks underscore SMB table and dividends underscore SMB table using the symbol column. So this criteria is met as well. And the last criteria is to set all these four properties. And this criteria is not met yet. So let's set all these four properties in our cluster. Now, all four properties are set. Now we are ready to execute the join query. But before we do that, let's quickly go over what will happen when we execute this join query. In step one, a MapReduce job will spawn mappers based on the big table. Since the stocks underscore SMB table is the big table in the join, the join operation will result in 10 mappers. In step number two, only matching buckets of all small tables are replicated onto each mapper. And step number three would perform the join operation on each mapper. Since the records are already sorted and only the matching buckets are considered in this join operation, this join is entirely performed on the map side, enabling a much faster join. Now that we understand how the SMB map join works, let's execute the query. The very first thing we'll see in the execution is the number of reduced tasks is set to zero which is exactly what we needed because SMB join is entirely done on the map face itself. So the execution is now complete and we have our output. Let's do one final check just to make sure our map reduce job executed with no reducers. You see 10 mappers got executed and with zero reduce. The number of mappers was chosen to 10 to match the number of buckets on the big table that is the stocks underscore SMB table. With that, we have come to the end of the lesson. In this lesson, the very first thing that we saw was how join works without any optimizations. And then we looked at two hints, stream table and map join hint. And next we talk about how can automatically convert your join instructions to map side joins. And finally, we saw how SMB join works and what are the criteria needed to execute an SMB join. Again, these concepts are very important and we are absolutely certain that there will be a need for you to implement these concepts in your day-to-day -day job. With that, let's wrap this lesson. See you in the next lesson.